All right, hello everyone. I'm Bob Leeser with Tulsa Global Alliance. On behalf of TGA and the Tulsa Utsunomiya Sister City Partnership, we welcome you to today's event, Understanding Godzilla from Hiroshima to COVID-19. TGA is recording today's talk and we'll share it on our social media later. And if you have questions for our speaker today after his talk, please write them in the chat box. Tulsa Global Alliance builds global community by working with the city of Tulsa to manage exchanges and activities between Tulsa and its eight international sister cities, which are San Luis Potosi, Mexico, Kaohsiung, Taiwan, Beihai, China, Tiberias, Israel, Utsunomiya, Japan, Zelenograd, Russia, Sela, Germany, and Amiens, France. And this year marks the 40th anniversary of the sister city program in Tulsa. TGA also hosts participants in the US State Department International Visitor Leadership Program and promotes international business and global education. Today's program will focus in part on the culture of Japan, home to Tulsa's sister city of Utsunomiya, though as our speaker, Dr. Bill Tsutsui has noted, Godzilla's cultural footprint is enormous and is worldwide. Introducing today's speaker is former Tulsa Global Alliance board member, vice chair of sister cities and global vision award winner, Dr. Jessica Stoll who is a colleague of our speaker and invited him to speak today. And uh, she's delivering her introduction on her way back from Dallas where she and Fred visited the Cherry Blossom Festival at the Dallas Arboretum and Botanical Bar Gardens. Thank you, Jessica. Well, I'm just delighted to be here, even sitting on the side of the road in a, we don't know where we are. <laughs> we are. Um, and I'm also not sure that I'm the ideal person to introduce this program. Since as we were watching the Godzilla versus Kong trailer, my husband found it important to tell me that the furry one was Kong. <laughs> but, but I'm happy nevertheless. And I think maybe I was given the honor because I have known Professor Setsui for a long time and I can pronounce his name. <laughs> he and I go back a number of years when he was at the University of Kansas and I was at the University of Oklahoma, and we collaborated for several years to bring professional development for educators on East Asia uh, to the, the uh, teachers in Kansas and Oklahoma and beyond that, actually. So a little relevant, relevant information. Professor Satsui teaches a highly popular course on Japanese monsters at Harvard. Now that's the university, not the street in Tulsa. Well, Japanese monsters at Harvard, um, we'll understand that a little more clearly um, after his presentation, but he did say he uses a very broad description of monsters. And um, I think it could be fascinating. He's currently the Edwin O. Reischauer Distinguished Professor of Japanese Studies for this academic year 20. 21 at Harvard. But be far beyond that, he's a specialist in the economic and environmental and cultural history of modern Japan. And before Harvard, he was president of Hendricks College in Conway, Arkansas. And you're still living in Conway, aren't you? That's right. Okay. They wouldn't let him go. <laughs> um, and uh, that was 2014 to 2019. And before that, he served as the Dean of Dedman College of Humanities and Sciences at Southern Methodist University from 2010 to 2014. And of course, before that, it was KU. Uh, his ongoing research focuses on the environmental and business history of the Japanese fishing industry and on Japanese popular culture. And in addition to the monsters class, at Harvard, he's teaching a research seminar in Japanese history there. And he's working with Professor Andrew Gordon on that uh, seminar. And he's also authored a book that you're going to want to look up after you hear this talk today. It's Godzilla on my mind, 50 years of the King of Monsters. And it's available, of course, on Amazon. <laughs> Professor Setsui came to OU Tulsa several years ago in person, and that was a big treat. He did a seminar on Godzilla and the political and cultural implications of Godzilla and the Godzilla phenomenon. And here he is back again, albeit on the small screen, 
to help us get the most out of the upcoming Godzilla versus Kong film. I know he'll have insights that, um, that bring Godzilla and Kong into focus and leave us understanding more about how divergent cultures and political systems interact and intertwine. And it will go beyond just the monsters because of the depth of his knowledge. So I'm honored to present my friend, Dr. Bill Satsui. Well, thank you so much for that, Jessica. I'm just gonna try and share my PowerPoint now uh, and hopefully uh, this will work, fingers crossed. Uh, is that working? Yes. Good, I'm really uh, glad. Well, it is a uh, joy to be here with you all today and to be back at least virtually in Tulsa, which is one of my very favorite places in the world. Uh, over the past years, my wife and I have daydreamed about what we would be most looking forward to uh, after the end of all this social isolation. Uh, uh, we have often thought about a piece of pie uh, from Antoinette Bakery and a stroll through the Philbrook downtown. Uh, so before too long, I hope we'll be able uh, to do that again. I really want to thank uh, Jessica Stoll for inviting me here this evening and for that lovely introduction. Uh, I want to thank Bob Leeser for organizing this event uh, so beautifully. Uh, I know Jessica is a gem uh, for uh, Tulsa. Uh, and has done so much to contribute to the international connectivity and awareness uh, of the city and the state and the region. And I am so impressed by all the great work that Bob and the Tulsa Global Alliance are doing uh, to build international ties, even in a time of pandemic. Uh, so it is an honor uh, to be here with you and I wanna thank you all uh, for tuning uh, in. Now to the main event, let's talk Godzilla. Well, I first encountered Godzilla when I was seven or eight years old. I remember it like it was yesterday. It was a Saturday afternoon in Bryan, Texas, where I grew up. I was lying on my stomach on the blue shag carpeting in my parents' bedroom in front of our big old Zenith TV set and its fake wood grain case. It was tuned to channel 39 from Houston and the creature double feature came on. I remember Godzilla appearing on the screen and I remember falling in love. I wanted to be Godzilla. I wanted to be huge. I wanted to be powerful. I wanted to be able to drag my big scaly feet through Tokyo and knock down skyscrapers and make chemical plants explode. Godzilla was and is a great kiddie fantasy, but Godzilla was more than that to me. As a chubby Japanese American boy in a small Texas town with a total of two Japanese American families, Godzilla was more than just a third grader's Saturday afternoon power trip. Godzilla became an important source of my personal identity. My friends and classmates at school, needless to say, didn't know a whole lot about Japan other than Pearl Harbor. And I guarantee you, they had never heard of the Japanese American internment but they all thought Godzilla movies were pretty cool. And so I embraced Godzilla as something about Japan and my heritage that I could relate to and be proud of. I'm guessing that most of you don't think of Godzilla as an ethnic hero, but he was to me. And here's a photo of uh, as close as I've actually gotten to becoming Godzilla, Halloween 1972 in a costume made by my mother and grandmother just about to head off to the haunted house at Davy Crockett Elementary School. So why tell this story? Well, partly because it gives me a chance to indulge in a bit of nostalgia, but more importantly, because it shows nicely, I think, how Godzilla is more than just a series of laughably cheesy films featuring an actor in a rubber suit walking through toy cities. Sure, Godzilla is a global pop culture icon, star of 33 live action films made in Japan and Hollywood, the oldest and longest film franchise in world history. And sure, Godzilla is fodder for The Simpsons, and has become part of our language through the Zilla suffix, and is the subject of more internet memes and New Yorker cartoons than anybody can count. 
Godzilla is lighthearted and silly and fun and childish, but Godzilla can, of course, also be serious and meaningful, offering commentary on current events, revealing insights on Japan and its post-war history, and providing an imaginative outlet for some of our deepest and darkest fears. On a personal level, Godzilla can be a lifelong friend and an unlikely source of ethnic identity. And up there on the silver screen, Godzilla affords us a valuable perspective on the people and the cultures that created the films, as well as a window into the obsessions, the weaknesses, and the deepest anxieties of all of us who have watched and enjoyed the series over the decades. We can learn a lot, it turns out, from Godzilla about Japan, about what scares us, and about ourselves. So let's spend the next 30 minutes or so reflecting on Godzilla, since the timing is just great with the new legendary Godzilla versus Kong opening just about 48 hours from now. What is the deal with this overgrown radioactive lizard that seems to love nothing better than destroying Tokyo? How did this global icon emerge from the imaginary of post-war Japan? Why does this cinematic monster continue to stir our imaginations and attract audiences? Perhaps most importantly, how has the Godzilla series addressed the anxieties of moviegoers in Japan and internationally since the 1950s, from the nuclear fear of the Cold War years to the environmental concerns of the 60s and 70s to the economic worries at the turn of the millennium? And what role might Godzilla play today as we all struggle with proliferating natural disasters like the earthquake, tsunami, and meltdown that hit Japan in 2011? And of course, with the current global pandemic. Now, one of the characteristics of modern societies, it seems to me, and to many cultural commentators, is a sense of ambient fear a pervasive anxiety that saturates daily life. Sometimes this fear is widely discussed and publicly agonized over, but much of the time people try to avoid speaking of it and try to push it into the background of their minds. In Japan in the 1950s, when Godzilla was born, this anxiety derived from the unresolved legacies of World War II, Hiroshima, and Nagasaki, and from the threat of nuclear annihilation in the Cold War. In the world today, and especially in America, there are more ambient fears than I can list, starting with COVID-19, of course, but including income and health care insecurity, and concerns over issues like democratic governance and racial equity. Such anxieties often manifest themselves as a widespread fascination with monsters, a fixation that is born of the twin desire to name and to give a face and form to fears that are often abstract or invisible, like radiation and viruses, and to domesticate, control, imaginatively overcome, and therefore disempower those things that threaten us. In short, monsters like Godzilla help us make our fears more concrete and thus more manageable. Seeing a giant lizard on a movie screen or reading about Dracula in a novel or hearing about dragons in a medieval tale allow us to have the cathartic experience of imagining some of our greatest terrors, but also the reassuring and liberating experience of imagining those monsters being controlled and ultimately defeated. So let's go back. Let's talk about Godzilla's origins. So in 1952, the Hollywood classic King Kong, originally made in 1933, was re-released around the world and was a smash hit, including in Japan. Hollywood saw the potential in giant monsters, so the next year Warner Brothers made The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms, which also turned out to be a blockbuster. Japanese film studios have never been shy about stealing a good idea, so Japanese movie makers began work on their own creature feature. But Godzilla was created not just from 
commercial ambitions at the box office, but was very much ripped from the headlines and conditioned by superpower politics and atomic age fears as well. In March of 1954, a Japanese fish fishing vessel called the Lucky Dragon Number no. 5 strayed into the US nuclear bomb testing zone near Bikini Atoll. The crew was exposed to massive amounts of radiation in the Castle Bravo test, the largest H-bomb test to date. One crew member subsequently died, and some of the irradiated tuna on the ship made it onto the market in Japan. At the time, the US government denied all uh, uh, reports of uh, nuclear testing, uh, so it never apologized uh, for this, and it paid only token restitution uh, to the families uh, of those uh, uh, injured uh, uh, and killed. Needless to say, this was huge news in Japan. The newspapers called it the latest atomic bombing of Japan, especially, of course, since the attacks on Hiroshima and Nagasaki remain such fresh memories, less than 10 years since uh, the atomic attacks. Godzilla was thus very much born of the atomic bombings and reflected Japan's collective trauma still raw in the 1950s at those horrifying events, at defeat in World War II, and at being occupied after the war by the United States for seven years. Now, Godzilla was apparently the brainchild of a Toho Studios producer named Tanaka Tomoyuki, who imagined the story of a dinosaur survivor from the Jurassic period that is rendered monstrous by US H-bomb testing in the South Pacific and ends up attacking Tokyo. Tanaka recruited absolutely top talent for his picture, since Godzilla was intended to be very serious, politically charged fare. For special effects, he hired uh, a real wizard named Tsuburaya Eiji, who had done amazing wartime propaganda films using miniatures. For director, he hired a guy named Honda Ishiro, who was personally committed to the anti-nuclear message uh, of the film. He had fought for the Japanese army during World War II. And like many soldiers coming home to Japan after the war, the American occupiers made sure he passed through Hiroshima so he could see the extent of Japan's defeat uh, and America's power with the atomic bombs. And that memory lived with him his ent entire life. He became a committed pacifist. Uh, he was also a remarkable professional. Uh, he was an associate uh, of the uh, uh, celebrated Japanese director, uh, Kurosawa Akira, and collaborated with him on several films that you may have seen, including Kagemusha. Now, the name Gojira, which was later rendered into English as Godzilla, was allegedly a nickname given to an overweight press agent at Toho Studios and was a combination of two Japanese words. Gorilla, meaning gorilla, and Kujira, meaning whale. Tanaka, the producer, is said to have loved it, and he took it for his monster. Now, Toho Studios invested a lot in that first Godzilla movie, 60 million yen, about three times the budget of the average Japanese film at the time, although far less, one should note, than Hollywood would have spent on a run-of-the-mill B-movie in those days. Gojira opened on November 3rd, 1954. Box office receipts were strong, and its popularity, as well as its export potential, were such that a whole Godzilla franchise was born. Godzilla King of the Monsters opened in the United States in 1956. It was a cleverly re-edited version of the Japanese original with the unfortunate addition of Raymond Burr as a voyeuristic American reporter who witnesses the destruction of Tokyo. This version was considerably altered from the original Japanese film. Some have called it censored or even whitewashed in its transition across the Pacific. Notably in that all references to World War II all mention of the atomic bombs and anything that could be considered even vaguely critical of the United States were removed. Another interesting fact is that the American version, so the Raymond Burr version, was subsequently subtitled in Japanese and released in Japan, where it was in turn very successful. Now, the original 1954 film, Gojira, is dark, 
It is thoughtful and it's politically charged. It was made for adult audiences and it simmers with implicit criticism of the United States, repressed feelings of Japanese pride and nationalism and anxiety over nuclear testing and the threat of nuclear war. It masterfully played upon the audience's fears of the mounting Cold War and the lingering psychological and physical scars of Hiroshima, Nagasaki, and the firebombing of Japanese cities during World War II. Many Japanese viewers at the time left movie theaters in tears. It was cathartic and therapeutic for a nation still struggling to make sense of its recent history and a world divided by superpower rivalries, where Japan was poor and vulnerable and caught between America and the Soviet Union. Gojira is surprisingly rich in meaning, especially for a movie about a giant angry lizard. And even though we may chuckle a bit at the special effects today, they really were state of the art for the time. Gojira is truly a classic. And if you haven't seen it, you should add it to your watch list Im immediately. And preferably uh, take a look at it before you watch uh, Godzilla versus Kong. Now, after that marvelous 1954 film, the quality of the franchise began to decline rapidly. The serious message of the first offering was quickly jettisoned for more crowd-pleasing fare, and the age of the target audience declined steadily. By the 1970s, eight-year-olds were the main market for giant monster pictures. The films degenerated into big-time wrestling in rubber suits, and the scripts and special effects were remarkably cheesy, though at the same time really humorous and enjoyable. Who couldn't laugh at the King of the Monsters flying on his tail or teaching his son how to blow radioactive smoke rings? or playing volleyball using a huge boulder with a gargantuan mutant lobster. This change in tone in the movies was due not just to changing audience demographics, but also due to changes in Japan. Japan in the 1950s was an impoverished developing nation, still recovering from defeat economically and psychologically. By the 1960s though, the Japanese economy was booming and people were optimistic increasingly affluent and not so interested in seeing their nation destroyed by Godzilla and by the parade of creatures design, designed by Toho to battle him. So monsters like Mothra, King Ghidorah, Rodan, and many others. So in this new, more confident, wealthier Japan, the movies became more lighthearted and Godzilla was repositioned as a defender of Japan, a heroic figure rather than as a vengeful monster intent on destroying the country. Godzilla has continued to evolve, of course, over the decades, reflecting the ongoing transitions in post-war Japanese society, in perceptions of where Japan stood in the world, in the shifting makeup of Japanese movie-going audiences, and in the development of the Japanese movie industry, which has weathered some really tough times uh, over the years. Remarkably, despite all the changes in the tone and market of the Godzilla films, not to mention the changes in the appearance of Godzilla, who morphed considerably in his looks uh, over the years, the franchise continued to engage regularly with the fears of audiences and timely issues of the day, mostly ones of importance in Japan, but also ones that resonated with global moviegoers. The 1954 Gojira was, as I've mentioned, very politically charged and dealt with the legacies of the atomic bombs and the fears of nuclear holocaust with a directness and a kind of visceral impact that was very uncommon in Jap Japanese media at the time. In the 1960s, as Japan recovered economically from World War II and the darkness of the 50s, the, address, the issues addressed included political corruption long a big issue in Japan, and the rampant commercialization of Japanese society. Japan really underwent uh, a, a, a consumer boom uh, as the country grew wealthier. In the 1970s, among the issues that the series took up were school bullying, uh, another big issue in Japanese society, and most famously, the pollution problem and environmental awareness. 
And if you have never seen Godzilla versus the smog monster, you are culturally deprived. It is psychedelic and crazy and wonderful and surprisingly effective uh, politically uh, as well. From the 1980s through 2004, a wide variety of issues uh, uh, were treated, sometimes superficially, sometimes more deeply. The nuclear issue returned, as did environmental concerns. Remilitarization and Japanese nationalism were big themes, memories of World War II, and interestingly, Japan's wealth and arrogance in the world. Tanaka Tomoyuki, the producer of many of the films, once said, and I quote, Japan is rich and people can buy whatever they want. But what is behind that wealth? Nothing very spiritual. Everyone's so concerned with the material and then Godzilla comes and rips it all apart. I suspect that's good for us all to see. So Godzilla even became something of a conscience for a wealthy, increasingly self-satisfied Japan. Although many of the movies in the franchise were not terribly timely or topical at all, what is impressive is the way in which Godzilla's makers regularly tapped into issues of widespread concern in Japan and globally to keep Godzilla something more substantial than just a big bit vengeful monster or a big heroic monster. Even in more recent years, as Godzilla has left the Pacific and been taken up by filmmakers in Hollywood, the monster has continued to mine the headlines for material and address our collective fears. The 1998 TriStar production, marketed under the slogan, Size Does Matter, has been panned by most Godzilla fans, myself included, and perhaps not surprisingly for a movie featuring an escapee from Jurassic Park and Ferris Bueller, was not a particularly thoughtful or politically engaged entry in the series. The most recent films have been different stories, however. The latest picture from Toho Studios in Japan is 2016's, 2016's Shin Godzilla, a remarkably interesting film which dealt with the triple disasters of 2011 and the Japanese government's feeble response. It also, incidentally, was partially filmed in Utsunomiya, Tulsa's sister city in Japan. Unfortunately, it was not a famous beauty spot or a dumpling restaurant in Utsunomiya that was featured in the film, but a conference room in the Tochigi prefectural office where a lot of guys in blue jumpsuits talked into microphones. I should also note that Back in the 1990s, a number of prefectural cities in Japan that had never been destroyed by Godzilla in any of the movies courted Toho Studios, advocating that their hometowns should get the opportunity to be obliterated on the silver screen by the monster. So at one point, Godzilla obliged doing a sort of tour of northern cities, Sendai, Aomori, Sapporo, but regrettably, Utsunomiya did not make the list. One day, perhaps in the future, it too can be destroyed. And that brings us then finally to the latest Hollywood offerings, the suite of Godzilla films in the MonsterVerse franchise from Legendary Pictures. The first Legendary offering, Godzilla, in 2014, was successful commercially and critically channeling the best of the Japanese Godzilla series and the best of early 21st century Hollywood movie making. It had a message, it had a heroic Godzilla, and it spoke to timely issues. Specifically, it addressed the human costs of natural disasters like the San Francisco earthquake, Katrina, and the 2011 quake, tsunami, and nuclear accident in Japan. The film did not use a man in a rubber suit to play Godzilla, which is uh, something that I really love in the movies. And while I might have preferred a slightly trimmer monster, especially as the CGI used to make the American film meant there didn't need to be a human inside a costume anymore, it did have great special effects and the kind of pacing and drama that Hollywood does so well in action pictures. Legendary's second movie, Godzilla King of the Monsters from 2019, 
was less successful in many respects, notably in its ham-fisted and harebrained attempts to address the threat of climate change, long an issue which I felt the Godzilla movies needed to tangle with. Consequently, even though I am hopeful about Legendary's third try with Godzilla, the long anticipated Godzilla versus Kong, which has an absolutely stunning trailer, I worry that it too will get sidetracked with convoluted plot twists rather than focusing on a heroic narrative featuring a big ape fighting with a big lizard. We'll all see in about two days time though. One observation I would make about Hollywood's Godzilla movies is that the character of the monsters they present is very different from that of the Japanese franchise. Specifically, the American Godzillas seem to be more like animals or other life forms driven by deeply programmed genetic or biological urges rather than like the more human monster presented by Toho. Thus, the tri-star creature is a mother impelled by deep maternal instincts. While the legendary Godzilla is motivated not by any identification with America, but by a deep, natural, primal compulsion to battle another form of giant monster called the Mutos for dominance. American filmmakers seem to want to see giant creatures animated by a kind of biological logic rather than anything approaching a real personality or character or soul. And this kind of narrow literalism carries over visually as well, as Hollywood has, of course, stressed special effects that are much more sophisticated and detailed and realistic than what Toho's man in a rubber suit could ever achieve. Finally, one aspect of the American Godzilla features that has struck and annoyed me is the way in which they all rewrite the origins of Godzilla, deviating from the story established in the Toho franchise to deflect the blame for creating the monster away from the Cold War and above all, away from US nuclear testing in the South Pacific. So if we go back to 1998 and the TriStar uh, Matthew Broderick uh, film, Okay, uh, 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 they don't want to pin the blame on American H-bomb testing. So how does Godzilla get irradiated? Well, if in doubt, who do you blame? Blame the French. It turns out in that movie, they said Godzilla was created by French H-bomb testing in Polynesia. And that's the reason why throughout that film, the annoying Jean Reno character is everywhere. Fast forward to 2014, then in the beginning of the Legendary series. What Legendary did was really clever, and yet it bothers me uh, a lot. So remember, in the Godzilla uh, uh, original, 1954, Godzilla is created by, is a dinosaur that's created by American H-bomb testing in the South Pacific, becomes monstrous, and attacks Japan. In Legendary's story, there is this whole subterranean world under the South Pacific that is just crawling with monsters. And in the 1950s, those monsters start popping out of the surface of the earth. The nations of the globe don't want to tell people that there are monsters on the loose, so they try to keep it secret. And to control those monsters, the US drops nuclear bombs on them, okay? Uh, and the story of H-bomb testing is then used as a convenient cover for all these bombs exploding in the South Pacific. It's a neat story, it is clever, and yet it deflects blame away from the United States and from the H-bombs for creating these monsters. It essentially makes uh, the US and those nuclear weapons almost humanitarian devices uh, in this story. Let me finish up then, because I've been talking a long time uh, already and I'm really eager to hear from you all. Let me finish up by reflecting a little on the meaning of Godzilla in a time of pandemic. The well-known writer, Mike Davis, has long described lethal viruses as monsters. His 2005 book on the avian flu in Asia was called The Monster at Our Door. With the appearance of COVID-19, he extended the metaphor and titled an updated version of the book released last year, The Monster Enters. It is a bit hard to imagine a microscopic virus as a monster. 
And of course, people and filmmakers faced the same problem after 1945, when another invisible threat, nuclear radiation, appeared on the scene as a similar challenge to human existence. Some would argue this was also the case with electricity as well at a much earlier time when jolts of voltage were unfamiliar and clearly dangerous and profoundly frightening to people. Frankenstein was one of the creatures born of a creative and psychic need to give shape to our fears of electricity. And Godzilla, along with cinematic creatures like the giant ants in them, were physical manifestations of radiation invisible but deadly, and with the dawn of uh, uh, atomic weaponry, gigantic in scale and sweeping in impact. I am sure there will be monsters created, and Godzilla may well fight them in future movies that give a tangible shape to the menace of an unseeable novel coronavirus. That brings us that back then, in the very end, to the question of why the world still loves Godzilla after all these decades, and why the monster is seemingly more popular today than ever before. On the most basic level, Godzilla is just plain fun. The exuberance, the cheesiness, the cathartic nature of destruction, all are just enjoyable to watch, whether you're six years old or 60. Godzilla is the outrageous guy that breaks all the rules and gets away with it, the walking disaster who leaves a trail of devastation behind him and inspires not just fear and loathing, but also admiration, awe, and an odd tingle of delight. But Godzilla also has a serious side. And I think one reason why we continue responding so strongly to him is because he has functioned as a cinematic conscience for viewers in Japan and globally since World War II. Godzilla's very presence, the disruption he causes to the status quo, and the existential threat the monster poses to our lifestyles, our comforts, our assumptions, and our complacency keeps us asking questions we know that we need to keep asking about issues like the environment, war, nuclear energy, arrogance, prosperity, technology, and now biosecurity, globalization, and the appropriate reach of governments during moments of crisis. Godzilla is, of course, not the only gargantuan creature on movie screens these days, as the whole genre of giant monster movies, kaiju films as they're known in Japan, is booming, perhaps more so than at any time since the 1950s or 1960s. So think about films like Cloverfield, Pacific Rim, Kong, Skull Island, and even quirky treatments uh, like Colossal. Perhaps this is due to nostalgia, uh, like uh, our embrace of Marvel Universe films. Perhaps it's our need to keep ratcheting up what excites and scares us with ever better special effects, ever more cinematic destruction, and ever bigger movie heroes and villains. Maybe it is catharsis in an age of disasters and terrorism and pandemics just like the Japanese felt back in 1954 when Gojira came out thinking about World War II and the threat of nuclear apocalypse. Maybe it reflects a sense of helplessness on the part of individual people facing a hostile and unpredictable world that they feel unable to control or change, not unlike what the audiences who watched Gojira felt at the volatile, uncertain start of the Cold War. In the end though, I think that what makes Godzilla so compelling for so many and so significant, not just for Japanese culture or American culture, but for global culture, goes somehow beyond the movie monster's longevity, ubiquity, topical relevance, and sentimental appeal. Godzilla distracts us and makes us laugh as entertainment is meant to do. Godzilla challenges us to think and feel in ways that pop culture so seldom does. And the Godzilla films shine with a profound and genuine optimism that we all need more of at a uniquely complex, unsettled, and anxiety-ridden moment. In the Godzilla series, movie after movie, human society endures 
Tokyo gets miraculously rebuilt and the King of the Monsters returns once again from the sea. This essential optimism, this faith in progress and in the resilience of human society was important in the 1950s when Godzilla helped Japan and the world recover from the nightmares of the atom bombs and remains powerful even today in the wake of more recent tragedies to hit Japan and threaten the entire world. On some level, Godzilla is just a man in a rubber suit, but I hope you'll agree with me that when all is said and done, the king of the monsters is truly so much more. Thank you all so much uh, for your attention and I welcome uh, your questions and comments and I'll stop sharing my screen now. Thank you very much, Professor Sutsui. We really appreciate uh, your insights about Godzilla. Um, and now we open it for questions from our audience. If anyone has any, please uh, either uh, raise your hand or type them into the chat. Uh, here we go. Question from Michael Danes. A question, I'd heard that one of the first buildings destroyed in the 54 film was the US Embassy. Is that true? Interesting question. Not as far as I know true, no. Uh, you know, I've watched those scenes pretty carefully to see what Godzilla is dragging uh, his feet through. And, and while he does take on some high profile uh, targets, shall we say, uh, in that first movie, the US Embassy is not one of them. So he destroys the Japanese parliament building, the Diet, uh, uh, and that's a great landmark. It's sort of like King Kong climbing up on the Empire State Building. Everyone uh, 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 can recognize the Diet building, so that's very iconic. He not that down. He goes to the center of Japanese commerce, to the Ginza, uh, and at one point uh, he knocks over the clock tower uh, on what's called the Hattori building, the Seiko Watch Company building, uh, which is now Wako Department Store, uh, right at the Ginza crossing. He then walks across uh, the river, and in so doing he passes by a round building, which is called the Nichigeki Theater. Uh, and he pauses for a moment, and you see Godzilla sort of leisurely swing his tail and he knocks the Nichigeki Theater over. What's funny about that is the Nichigeki Theater was the flagship property of Toho Studios, uh, the studio that made uh, the, uh, uh, the movie. So it's sort of like all those jokes about Fox uh, on The Simpsons, right? The makers of the movie were uh, uh, sort of uh, needling the bosses uh, a little bit there. But he avoids the core of Tokyo. So he avoids um, uh, where the US Embassy is. And he also avoided uh, MacArthur's headquarters building. And most importantly, he avoids the Imperial Palace. To go and step on the emperor. In fact, in all of the movies, he avoids the imperial palace and he avoids uh, tangling with something uh, as symbolically and emotionally charged uh, as the imperial institution. Thanks very much. You actually just answered another question about whether the imperial palace ever got Oops, targeted. Sorry, Bob, I can't hear you. I think it's my end. Ah, uh, can you hear? I can hear you now. Okay, great. Um, here's another question. See if you can answer. Who were those weird twins in the Mothra film? <laughs> so, you know, there are several great mysteries in the Godzilla series that none of us can answer, okay? So one of us is, is Godzilla male or female or neither, you know? I call Godzilla a he, but who knows, right? Uh, you know, I can't sex lizards. I see no visible uh, uh, signs of whether he's one or the other. So who knows? Why does he attack Japan? Nobody quite knows. He just started attacking Japan. There's no real logic for why he is drawn there and then why he ends up being a defender of Japan. The other one is, what is the deal with those two little ladies that sing at Mothra? Uh, and I wish I had a good answer for you on that. But the success of what they did with the film is obvious in the fact that you all asked about it and almost anyone who knows Godzilla movies knows about those little, they were called fairies, the shobijin, the small beauties, uh, technically they were called in Japanese, who sing to Mothra and are sort of its uh, 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 
uh, uh, spirit companions uh, throughout uh, uh, the film. Uh, you know, uh, it is worthwhile if you haven't gone back to see the original Mothra uh, to do it uh, because uh, it is crazy, it is funny, it is fantastical, and it is marvelous. You know, one of the things you want cinema to do is to transport you, to take you out of asking, you know, uh, the kind of uh, very logical, precise questions that we have to do every day uh, in the real world. And I tell you, Mothra does that. Uh, the idea that there's a giant moth living on an island somewhere in the South Pacific, tended by two little fairies, that's good stuff. Yeah, and then there was a joke from Matt Britton at World Denver saying, considering how much it destroys things, it's probably male. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I'm with you. I always call him the big guy. So am here's a question. To, oh, am I allowed uh, to ask a question on the um, on the speaker? Sure, go ahead. Um, my, I, how should I say this? Um, I'm a bit of a like monster versus monster fan myself, but I also, uh -huh. I, I really, I watched Shin Godzilla when it came out and really enjoyed it and how it related to the original film and the, the aftermath of Hiroshima and the atomic bombs. And I, th and I understood your criticism of the monster films, especially King of the Monsters, and it, it deviated away from this deeper understanding of Hiroshima and aftermath and the anxieties of that stuff. But I also thought, is it possible that simultaneously we could have these monster versus monster films that are a bit cheesier, a bit more for, I, I don't wanna say immature audiences, but they're not as deep and meaningful as well as having stuff like Shin Godzilla and the original Godzilla films side by side as two potential interpretations of Godzilla. Do you think we could have that simultaneously and still keep Godzilla as an important cultural icon? The answer is a short yes, and I wish that we would do that, you know? I think, uh, you know, we all want to see both of those things uh, on some level. I think uh, the recent Godzilla King of the Monsters would have been a much better movie if it had just focused on the monsters fighting uh, and ditched uh, the kind of convoluted plot with eco-terrorists and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and then the stupid thing at the end where Godzilla uh, uh, cures the climate crisis sort of magically uh, uh, with a wave of his tail. You know, if it had just focused on those fight sequences, which were marvelous, it would have been a very satisfying movie. You know, sort of like Pacific Rim. Pacific Rim didn't have a whole lot of uh, uh, narrative didn't have a lot of storyline to it, but boy, who doesn't like seeing giant robots fighting giant monsters, okay? I sort of hope that Godzilla versus Kong focuses on the action element uh, of the films. And I hope, you know, at this moment in particular, I think we just all need that catharsis of watching two big creatures wailing on each other for 90 minutes. Uh, I don't think I need to see uh, a, a whole lot of human narrative uh, to go along with that. At this moment in time, uh, let's just see them fight. Uh, and then the next movie, it can reflect a little bit uh, on the pandemic uh, and the world. I actually think the movies could reflect very interestingly on our current uh, situation. Uh, but right now, I think we really just want to have some fun. So I think, you know, I think you're right on. I wish you were running the studios, frankly. Thank you. Uh, here's a question from Jenny Shea. In relation to Japanese film industry, can Godzilla be considered the forerunner of modern Japanese environmentally centered movies, including Princess Monake? What a great question. You know, I think what is interesting is, uh, and you will know this already, but some of the others might not, Japanese pop culture has been quite uh, progressive in its engagement with environmental issues. Uh, that uh, some of the uh, topics that are difficult to discuss uh, in Japanese polite society that are controversial, therefore people don't like to talk about them, pop culture has taken those head on. And Godzilla really was a pioneer in that regard. People didn't talk about the atomic bombings a lot in the 1950s. That was a sensitive topic. It was an emotional topic. So most people preferred to ignore it, like religion and politics, uh, right? Godzilla wrestled with it, you know, and really opened room in that pop culture space for others with uh, strong political ideas to have some input. Uh, and I think, you know, one of the people uh, who uh, went the furthest with that was Miyazaki Hayao, who made uh, Studio Ghibli, made those wonderful uh, environmentally uh, engaged 
films uh, that look at what the consequences could be uh, of continued exploitation of the world and warn us that we need to be in harmony uh, with nature. We need uh, to change our ways. So yes, I think Godzilla uh, very much uh, 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 laid the groundwork uh, for that and empowered people in that pop culture space to speak out. Thank you. Here's a question from Alicia Ferguson. Which Godzilla film is your personal favorite and why? Godzilla versus Biollante is mine. Well, you have made a good choice. That is a great film. I love that film. There are many that I could uh, pick out. I say the, it's the first movie. It's the 1954 uh, Gojira. I have probably seen that movie 80 times. Uh, and, you know, I sometimes think I could recite it. Uh, I've seen it uh, so many times. And yet every time I watch it, I see something different. It's crazy. Some other aspect of it, based on what's happening in the world, what's happening in my life, just how much attention I'm paying to little details jumps out at me. So I had a big debate on a webinar with a scholar from Japan as to whether the original Godzilla film was made with the collaboration of the Japanese armed forces. And he said it was not. And I said, I thought it was. Uh, and uh, uh, we both agreed that they use stock footage of military scenes from uh, uh, before uh, 1954, but we really disagreed of whether the military was involved. And then I was watching the movie with my class. This must have been about two weeks ago. And all of a sudden I looked in the final scene, everyone is gathered on the deck of a ship and I looked at the lifeboat and there are people talking. So you don't really look at the lifeboat very often. I looked at the lifeboat and the little tiny writing along the side of it and darn it if it didn't say in Japanese National Coast Guard Agency, okay? And that proved it, right? They were on a Coast Guard ship uh, at the end to make that scene. And so, yeah, that was the uh, collaboration with the Japanese government. So, you know, uh, it pays watching 81 times uh, as well. If you're gonna watch others, I would say Godzilla versus the Smog Monster is a must see. Shin Godzilla from 2016 is a great, great film. The legendary 2014 Godzilla is fabulous. Uh, and one of my other favorites uh, is Godzilla versus uh, King Ghidorah. Uh, uh, again, just a fun, fun movie. Sorry, thank you. Uh, looks like we've got three more questions in the chat. Let's see if we can get to them. Af uh, Chip Duell asks, after Hollywood remade the first Godzilla movie and excised much of the original material, did this provoke conversation about SCAP style censorship or censorship in general when it was shown in Japan? Really great question. Uh, and it's so such a pleasure to see Chip, who's a former student of mine and who I'm so proud of uh, for all that he has achieved in those years since we were together at KU. Thanks for coming tonight, uh, Chip. Great question. You know, you would think that Japanese audiences might have responded negatively to the treatment that the film got in its transition to Hollywood, uh, being sliced and diced and all the content being taken out of it. The fact of the matter is, in those days, Japan, most Japanese people uh, felt uh, so intimidated by Americans uh, and uh, so impressed when America noticed something from Japan uh, that uh, uh, they approved of. I believe audiences went to see the subtitled version of the Raymond Burr film because they sincerely wanted to see how Hollywood had improved the movie. You yeah, know, uh, that they felt uh, not insulted by the cuts, but that maybe Hollywood had made it better uh, in the process. And in any case, that Hollywood had recognized something Japanese as being of high quality. The fact of the matter is, all of the Godzilla movies that came to the United States from 1954 through the 1970s ended up being subjected to significant surgery in the trans transition. There was no Japanese movie in the time that played the same in America, even with dubbing and subtitling as it had in Japan. They uh, edited it out. Uh, they uh, took out whole scenes. They changed the soundtrack. Uh, American distributors felt the Japanese movies were boring. Uh, and in some ways, they are a bit boring. It often takes a good 15 or 20 minutes in the Japanese films before you see the monster. And the Hollywood distributors felt you need to see the monster five or six minutes uh, in. Uh, so one of them once remarked, you know, the Japanese movies, they all start with a committee meeting. 
And it's true, it's very Japanese, right? To have a committee meeting at the very start of a movie where the military leaders and the scientists all sit down and they name the monster and they talk about strategy and so forth. Hollywood would cut that out. Uh, and so this, this censorship, this editing continued over time and just became a part uh, of the globalization uh, of that franchise. Nevertheless, when you go back and look at it and, uh, and see the impact that had uh, and the way it scrubbed the politics uh, and the criticism from that original movie, it is sort of a shame that American audiences had to wait almost 50 years till they could see the original. Thank you. Here's a question from Parida Stortini. Thank you for answering the question about the Imperial Palace. I was wondering if you had any, any ideas about the God incarnate element in the title of the Shin Godzilla film after 311 or representations of religious elements in the film series. So we could sit here for a long time. I love the question. We could sit here for a long time talking about Shinto, so Japan's uh, native uh, belief structure and uh, the Godzilla films. So in Japan, as you know, the uh, uh, folkloric monsters are called yokai. Uh, yokai are sort of the ghosts and goblins uh, of uh, Japanese uh, history. And they are very closely related in the Japanese traditions. Demons and monsters are very closely related to gods or kami. The Japanese Shinto is an animistic uh, religion. It believes their spirits in, in all living things and even in inanimate objects. So a tree can have a spirit, a rabbit can have a spirit, a mountain can have a spirit. In fact, even my cell phone uh, can have a spirit uh, within us. And those things may be monsters or they may be demons. One of the most prominent scholars on Japanese monsters has suggested that the dividing line between a demon and a uh, God is the fact that the God gets worshiped and the demon does not. So the demon is sort of ticked off and wants to get revenge uh, against human beings. And I think we see that in the Godzilla movies. Godzilla is on that fine line between God and monster. Uh, and perhaps you might even see the transition in Godzilla from the 1950s into the 1960s as once the Japanese come to appreciate Godzilla and recognize Godzilla and give him his due, he becomes more of a protector, more of a kami, more of a god uh, for the country. Uh, so uh, I think these beliefs uh, are deeply woven uh, into Japanese uh, society, and they affected how people viewed uh, these films. They affect pop culture today. If you watch uh, Kondo Marie, you know, the tidying woman uh, on uh, uh, TV, uh, who is very famous uh, for uh, going into people's houses uh, and cleaning them up, she's an animist as well in this Shinto tradition. She encourages people before they get rid of their pen to thank it and then to send it away so it doesn't become a monster and come back and haunt them. Thank you. And the final question goes to Matt Britton, similar to Alicia's earlier question. This might be like asking, which one of your kids is your favorite? What's the best Godzilla movie? Oh, who can say? It is like favorite kids. You know, all of them are great in some respect. I spent a little bit of time the past couple of weeks uh, just for fun watching some of the old movies, even some that I pan a bit uh, in my book, because some of them uh, really are uh, pretty cheesy. There is something to love in each one of them. They are crazy, you know? Uh, who knew that the people that made Godzilla movies were inspired in one by Planet of the Apes and there's a race of ape people in one of the movies? Who knew there was an undersea civilization, uh, monsters sent uh, from outer space? There is crazy and wonderful stuff uh, in these films, but they also make you think. Uh, and that's, uh, that's what I love. Even at some of the times when they seem the silliest, uh, they make you reflect uh, on uh, 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 Japan, uh, on the world, uh, and what uh, we're afraid of. Uh, and, you know, uh, one of the great things about him, Godzilla is evergreen. Uh, Godzilla is not like an actor who ages over time, gets the gray hair, and no longer can play a character. You can keep making rubber suits forever. So I think Godzilla movies are around for as long as any of us are. Well, thank you very much, Professor Tsutsui, for joining us today and for all of your insights. We really appreciate your time. If I could ask if everyone can just take a second to unmute yourselves and give him a round of applause. <laughs> thank you. We really thank you so much. This was a lot of fun. I really loved your questions. This is a great discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um,
<laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And uh, if anyone is interested in seeing more of these kinds of things, uh, please follow Tulsa Global Alliance on our Facebook page or uh, subscribe to our electronic newsletter through our website. We also will be putting this talk and others like it on our YouTube channel, which I just put into the chat for you to subscribe. And uh, thank you everyone for joining us from wherever you were. We appreciate your being with us and have a good night. Thank you.